This is one of my favorite time lapses and one of my favorite chases as well. In this time lapse you'll see a storm from its birth as towering cumulus to its death as a gusting out high precipitation supercell, as well as several tornadoes in between, including the mile wide Bottle South Dakota EF4. It's rare for me to be on the storm of the day when it initiates, but to be on what may have been the storm of the year when it initiates, getting video of the entire sequence was just incredible. I met up with Brad Goddard and Brandon Sullivan by coincidence on a remote stretch of road in the Black Hills, and we decided to team up for this chase. We were later joined by Kevin Cromer and Zach Chappell. By late afternoon we were sitting northeast of Pierre, watching some meager looking cumulus and wondering when if ever storms would initiate. I was calling it a cat bust and our small cumulus field was drifting away from us so we decided to start heading north to keep up with it. And that's when storms exploded. You can see the cumulus towers building here already. I tilted the camera up to get the top of the tower. You can see a Pileus cap on the top. These clouds form when air above the storm is literally pushed upwards by a rapidly rising tower. This is a sign of a very strong updraft. These storms went off like a bomb. I could see them growing vertically in real time, and I had to keep nudging the tilt control on the camera to follow the top of the storm until the camera was fully vertical with the storm stretching overhead. Tilting the camera back down now, I had a view of the tower's base. The storm was just barely putting down precipitation at this point, and it was probably already supercellular thanks to the amazing parameters that were in place on this day. There's some flanking line towers going up behind the storm. The supercell we were chasing would literally eat these towers, gaining strength in the process as their updrafts combined. These cumulus were also very photogenic. This portion of South Dakota is a great place to chase. The gently rolling green hills provided an unobstructed view of the horizon, and there is a great road grid here as well. With a good view of the rain-free base, we stopped here to let the storm mature. The storm was now tornado warned. We had gone from a cumulus field to a tornado warned supercell in about a half an hour. I had never seen a supercell initiate as rapidly as that before. Here you can see the rear flanking downdraft punching through the updraft base cutting a horseshoe shaped notch in the back of it. This would be the first cycle of the storm. The storm was not quite ready yet to put down a tornado, and would cycle about four more times before it finally did, and then would continue putting down tornado after tornado. The truck and white car going past us here belong to Tim Samaris and Tony Laubach of the Twistex team. That nub shaped lowering in the middle of the rain-free base is probably a weak attempt at a tornado. Perhaps the storm had not tightened up enough or established a strong enough downdraft in order to produce a legitimate tornado yet. the north the storm was already starting to cycle again. This lowering here was probably a developing wall cloud. You can see it's pulling in rain cold air rapidly and the base is lowering. The storm was cycling to the northeast so we had to move to keep up with it. You can see a second rear flanking downdraft punching through the base here already. This storm was cycling very rapidly and gaining strength each time. Unless conditions are just right, many times the supercell will simply gust out and die after it cycles once or twice. We had a great view of a very mature wall cloud here as it passed just to the north. Had the storm produced a tornado right now, we would have been in the perfect position to view it. You can really see the surging forward motion of the horseshoe shaped updraft base here. There are tight areas of rotation above us and further north where the storm is getting ready to cycle again. Our road here was not paved and there turned out to be no decent ways to go east for several miles. So we wound up having to go north until we got to a big east-west highway. This took us directly underneath the rain-free base on a rapidly strengthening supercell that could have dropped a tornado at any second. 
I was also worried that we'd drive into the storm's precipitation core and hit severe hail before we made it to our east road and were able to get back out ahead of the storm. As you drive under the base of the storm, if you look at the top of the screen, you can see a green colored area. This is where the rear flanking downdraft was cutting a huge vault shaped channel through the storm. Underneath this feature, you could look straight up into the heart of the storm. It was a very dramatic view. I was a little preoccupied trying to find a road that would get us out from underneath the storm at this point, so I missed positioning the camera to record this. Things happen very rapidly now at this point. Looking over my right shoulder, we could see an area of very rapid rising motion and strong rotation. This is where the first tornado would drop. You'll see this as a lowered area on the storm's base. Then looking straight ahead, you'll see a classic wall cloud with a pointy tail cloud, as the storm is already revving up a new mesocyclone before the old one has occluded and produced a tornado. You'll see we drive right underneath this wall cloud before I swing the camera over to the right to catch the first tornado touchdown. We were coming up from behind the tornado and we didn't want to let it get too far ahead of us, so we kept driving here to maintain our view of it. Ahead of the tornado here, we stopped to watch it pass while it dissipated. Meanwhile, a second funnel spun up right behind it. Both were orbiting the mesocyclone. The stovepipe tornado then formed extremely rapidly. We were behind the tornado again and we realized that we'd have to race it before it crossed our road and stranded us behind debris. I floored the van here and the wind noise got so loud that the shock sensor on my camcorder was tripped and I lost about a half minute of video. We beat the tornado across the highway and you can see the bottle wedge developing right behind us. Check out the storm structure above the storm as the rear flanking downdraft carves out a violently churning mesocyclone. The bottle wedge tornado is now fully underway. This tornado was rated EF4 on the enhanced Vegeta scale, and at its biggest was up to a mile wide. We drove through the town of Bottle Gear to get to a good north road that would put us right in front of the tornado. This town is extremely lucky as they came very close to a direct hit. I don't doubt that this tornado would have most likely been rated EF5 if that were the case. The downdraft wrapped completely around the tornado, carving it out and giving a glimpse thousands of feet above the ground into the heart of the storm. We stopped here directly in the path of this monster tornado. Brad and I briefly considered using the gravel roads here to keep our position in front of the tornado, but had we got stuck we'd be in extreme danger. Stopping here again I could hear the thunderous roar of this tornado, like a giant waterfall and my ears were popping as well. Disaster struck at this point as Kevin Cromer's car started smoking. We had to bail south to get away from the tornado and the rear flanking core. Kevin ditched his car on the side of the road here, grabbed his phone and camera and jumped in the van with me where we continued the chase. The bottle wedge had now roped out and the rear flanking core wrapped around the updraft base cutting off our view so we had to jet east to get ahead of it. I was worried that the storm had permanently transitioned into a high precipitation supercell and we were done seeing tornadoes. However, a big rear flanking downdraft swept through and cleaned out the base of the storm. Meanwhile, chasers behind us were reporting that there was a rain wrapped tornado underway in the core of the storm. You can see the base reorganizing with gorgeous supercell structure, a big barrel meso and inflow band feeding into the storm on the right. Before we could get to our north road, a funnel started to dangle under the base of the storm and an elephant trunk shaped tornado quickly dropped. The tornado appeared to lift but dozens of sub vortices danced within the truncated funnel. It soon fully condensed for one last show. After the tornado lifted, the base again started to fill in with rain, and the storm returned to a high precipitation mode. But then another rear flanking downdraft would sweep through and clean it out again, and return the storm to a classic mode. I can't ever recall seeing a supercell that was able to go from high precipitation to classic mode like this storm, and it truly was a testament to the storm's amazing strength. You can see here it's back to a high precipitation or HP mode again. We were playing it safe at this point, using the main east-west highway to stay ahead of the storm and then using major county roads to go north to stop in front of the storm for a few minutes before then dropping back to the highway and repeating. With the storm's history of extremely large and violent tornadoes, we didn't want to take our chances with the unpaved road grid. Here you can see a gorgeous time-lapse shot of the supercell structure. You can see the entire meso rotating here and a big donut hole cutting through the base of the storm where the rear flanking downdraft or RFD is punching through. This is about when the storm permanently transitioned into a high precipitation mode. The storm was not done producing tornadoes however as several more would spin up within the core.
Here you can see multiple inflow bands feeding into the storm. The storm was going HP, but it was nowhere near done. As the base started to fan out and we lost our good structure, we decided to call it a chase and get Kevin back to his car. We stopped here to let the storm come to us one last time. The plan was to drop south a mile or two to get away from the core of the storm, where we then head west to get back to Kevin's car. The highway was now filled with storm chasers. Sean Casey's intercept vehicle and the Discovery Channel teams go past us here, and you can see Twistex heading down the highway as well. There were so many cars that we had trouble making across the highway, and I was worried that we were going to get cored by the storm before we were able to cross. We finally made it across between the gap and the cars. Looking back and to the right, you can see the core of the storm crossing behind us. There may have very well been rain-wrapped tornadoes embedded within, but we were not about to core punch and find out. We took a gravel road west and tried to dodge the storm to the south. A severe squall line was rapidly forming to the south of the original supercell, however, and we wound up having to punch through that instead. We had some gusty winds and a little hail, and there was quite a bit of water and edges of mud on the road. I was worried we'd get stuck, but we made it through. It was about this time when a couple of my chase partners, Adam Lucio and Danny Neal, along with about a dozen other chasers, got into some serious trouble. They had been gambling with the unpaved roads to the north of the main highway, and even though the map said the road went through, it abruptly ended. With three tornadoes closing in, they tried to drive across the field and escape to the south, but they all got stuck as the rain and the storm's core turned the field into a lake. The tornadoes passed quite close, but luckily they didn't take any direct hits. You can see video from this amazing event on Convective Addiction's Bullseye Bottle DVD. We're back on the main east-west highway now, and we had a really pretty end to our chase. You can see some sun rays punching through the clouds' base. Fortunately, no one was killed by the Bottle EF4, and the town itself was spared. After the chase, we passed a farm where the wedge had first formed right behind us as we crossed the highway. It looked like there was some F1 to F2 damage there, but they too had been spared the bulk of the tornado's power, as damage survey crews had found that it had ripped high-tension power lines out of their concrete anchors when it was at its strongest. We made it back to Bottle and found Kevin's car intact, and after a few adjustments he was back in business and on the road again.